Hello and welcome to the Visible Man podcast. I'm Jack Rollins, the producer for the show. On today's episode, Jeff chats with Dr. Rob Whitley, associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry at McGill University and research scientist at the Douglas Research Center about cultural differences in men's mental health. Just a heads up, there were some technical issues with Dr. Rob's audio, but we feel that the message was important enough to warrant airing this in spite of said issues. Finally, as always, the show is for educational and entertainment purposes only and is not intended to replace medical or professional help. If you need medical or professional help, please seek out the appropriate person in your area. Enjoy. Thanks for being with us here today, Rob. Appreciate your time. I think you might be on mute right now. Hello, sorry. Oh, there yes. we go. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Please don't be here. <laughs> it's, like, it's nice to see you and now to hear you too, Rob. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm really happy to, uh, to have you with us today. Um, when we do peer support at Visible Man, we support each other, but um, to have someone like yourself who's got literally decades of research um, and experience um, it really helps us become better supporters of each other and kind of, and just really educate us. So I really appreciate you being here with us. Well, happy to help out all the brothers who are in need of help and need of support. I appreciate that. Um, before we get started, I'm wondering if you could introduce yourself um, for the people that don't know of you. You've got a Psychology Today blog every month that guys can check out. Um, you just published a book and I know it's probably difficult to distill your entire career into a few sentences, but for some background, if you wouldn't mind giving some uh, introduction, that might help. Sure. So um, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming to listen to me today. Um, as Jeff said, I, I recently published a book. This is a copy uh, of Men's Issues and Men's Mental Health. Um, it's a textbook. It's about 250 pages. Um, and I also write a blog for Psychology Today called Talking About About Men, a monthly blog where I take a different aspect of men's mental health and talk about it in about a thousand word article. And the, the book is really builds on my Psychology Today blog because a lot of people ask me, is this book really for kind of PhD type people or doctors or for people, social workers or kind of people working in academia? And the answer is no, it's not actually. It's it's also aimed at the general reader, the kind of intelligent lay reader who's thought about these issues and is interested. Um, and, and as you said, Jeff, um, I don't really know if there's much more I can add to your great introduction. I've, I've been working in the field for uh, about 20 years or so, published my first paper in the last century sometime. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah, so I've been around for a while and uh, happy to chat about all these issues together. That's great. Um... Actually, what, why, why you, you brought up the book, um, men's mental health is sort of, a, I mean, we've been around as long as time, obviously, but the topic of men's mental health is, it, it feels to me like there's more attention being given to it recently. And I'm wondering what motivated you or what motivates you to, to publish that now and, and, how the, and how the reception for that has been since you've started to, to do that. Yeah, so the emergence of the field of men's mental health has only occurred in about the last decade or so. Before that, there wasn't really a definable field of, of men's mental health. Um, and what we've seen in the last few years is a kind of collective awakening that men's mental health is important. This has come from organisations such as the British Parliament, which had an inquiry into the mental health of men and boys in 2019. It also comes from... Uh, organizations like the National Institutes of Health in the US who have invested money in men's mental health research um, beyond blue in Australia. Uh, but also the average kind of man and woman on the street is now recognizing that this is important. Um, a, uh, a lady, sadly her husband died of suicide um, about two years ago and she contacted me and said instead of flowers at the funeral I would like to my the people in my entourage to donate money to your research lab. Oh, wow. And I thought that was a yeah, it's a real, uh, very touching moment for me. And um, we've been using that money very wisely. And I just say it to show uh, that some people, when you say you're going to talk about men's issues and men's mental health, they feel that it's kind of excluding women or that it's, mm -hmm. uh, I've even heard people say, well, it's kind of 
verging on misogyny to like not be dealing with women's mental health. Um, and what I say is that there's hundreds of researchers doing research on women's mental health, but there's not many on men's mental health. And it's and I, I receive unfailing support from women, from daughters, wives, mothers, sisters, friends, colleagues who feel that the the men in their life need more support and need more action in terms of research and clinical delivery of services. So. Um, I, I think we're at a point in time where there's a really real window of opportunity to uh, change things about men's mental health. There's been a kind of collective awakening. There's a groundswell of opinion uh, from the average man and woman. Uh, so that kind of propelled me to write the book in the hope that this would also give a, uh, it's a review of the scientific evidence. I've tried to write it in accessible language uh, because we do also see on Twitter and social media a lot of baloney said about men's mental health and a lot of people who really haven't looked at the literature or not qualified to talk with any depth about the, the key issues or the key risk factors or the key programs that can help men, but are kind of talking with an authority that they don't really deserve to have. Um, so I, I'm trying to be a voice of a, a researcher of somebody who's immersed in the literature uh, in this debate. And, and it's, it's it was published a few months ago and I've done uh, uh, a few podcasts since and I've done a book, a few book launches, an online one, an in-person one. So uh, it would have been more fun if COVID wasn't happening. I could have done more in-person book launches, but uh, so far, so good. It's, it's the summary. Oh, that, that's good. Yeah, I've seen you've already had a, a few thousand downloads on it just in a few months. So you're, uh, <laughs> you're, it's, uh, there's definitely a need for it. And you bring up, you bring up a good point about misogyny because but the lack of misogyny, I should say, um, that it's a fear that I have personally when when I talk about men's mental health that there's a perception that it's at the expense of women, um, and it's not. A, I, I suppose in some parts of the manosphere, as they call it, that that could be the case. But but I know from your work that it, that that you advocate for men, but not at the expense of women, for sure. Um, I mean, in psychiatry, there's lots of different subspecialties. There's people looking at African American mental health, at the mental health of American Indians, at the mental health of young people. Uh, doesn't mean any of those researchers but don't believe that everyone else in society doesn't need attention. Right. It's uh, just you need to specialize to become an expert, and we need different experts in working in different subdomains of psychiatry. And as it happens, I'm working in men's mental health, and there are many others working in other areas. And, long may that continue yeah yeah um you brought up all those uh, the other demographics and one of the things when i look at the work that you've done i'm I'm such a people watcher i find people fascinating um and what i love is the humanity that we all share um and your work has has spanned different countries religions economic statuses um i know you, you've done work on um Muslims in English-speaking countries, black women in Montreal, Ethiopian, Ethiopian women in Middle Eastern countries, just tons of different variables. How influential are those factors of variables such as where you're born, what language you speak, and ethnic background in mental mm -hmm. health and, and the, the risk factors and the protective factors? Mm -hmm. Uh, would I like to add to your list? I also lived in the United States for uh, quite quite some years and did a lot of research in New York City and Washington DC, um, looking at African Americans and different ethnic groups. Uh, and uh, because I know most of your listeners are in the US, yeah. um, I, I think if we look, if we compare kind of ethno cultural groups, say within the US, which is a very diverse country. There are two or three kind of key variables which differ, which seem to affect men's mental health. Um, one is religion. So mm. we know that uh, ethnic minorities tend to be more religious and take their religion more seriously than um, white Caucasian people in the US. Um, and this has been one of the explanations behind the fact that black people in the US, uh, black men have much lower suicide rates than white men. Um, and Asian American men also tend to have lower suicide substance use issues than white men. Really? Um, wow. And yeah, the higher rates of religiosity would be one explanation. Hmm. Um, the other explanation, well, there's many, and there's not one single explanation, it's kind of multifactorial um, determinants. Another explanation relates to the family. Um, so we know that white Caucasian men in like North America and Canada, the US, um, 
we know statistically that when they become a member of a nuclear family, the men tend to put a lot more, um, uh, spend a lot more of their time within that nuclear family and, and let their, some of their other male friendships and their family members kind of uh, go, go to the margins of their life. Mm. Um, so that if a white man is going to get divorced, they're often left in a very uh, lonely and isolated place because over the course of time, their friendships have diminished uh, with other men and other people out- outside of their nuclear family. Whereas we know for minority men, for example, um, that they tend to maintain many of those friendships that they have, that the nuclear family is kind of important, but so is the extended family, uh, cousins, brothers, aunt, aunts, uncles. So when they face a crisis, say, for example, uh, severance, unemployment, divorce, that there's a greater safety net within the kind of local family and the local ethno-cultural community. Um, so uh, I could also talk about individualism. Yeah, um, absolutely. It's a very indivi- the United States uh, evolved really based on the ethos of individualism. Uh, Tocqueville talks about that in his famous book, uh, Democracy in America. Um, that, that when the Puritans came to New England originally, they had a very individualistic e- ethos, and that the, when uh, the, the development of the West, uh, uh, this, this is well known, kind of rugged individualism is, is a part of kind of tough, true grit, you know, John Wayne, American, mm-hmm. the American <laughs> mentality, mm-hmm. um, which again, again is, is less shared in kind of minority men, like black men, and, uh, Hispanic men, uh, Asian American men. Um, so this is one of the explanations why there are different rates of kind of suicide, substance abuse, depression uh, between different ethnocultural groups. And these are some of the explanations, um, which, which is a kind of long way of saying, you know, there's a lot that uh, men of Caucasian background can learn from men of other backgrounds. Um, and, and also that we're kind of born into a subculture, like a fish is born into the sea. Mm. We don't necessarily... Uh, know what we're experiencing until you get taken out of the sea and if you if you go and uh, done like said research in african-american neighborhoods in, in washington dc uh, you really see like the collectivist ethos qu- quite different to say if you went to uh, um, uh, i don't know uh, north virginia uh, where the, in the white suburbs of washington dc where people live in a house with a white picket fence and mm. everything's happening within the four walls of that house and there's not often not much outside of that mm. So I'm, I'm 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 trying to put myself in your shoes, and you and I look rather similar in some ways. <laughs> um, <laughs> what was it like for you to go into I, these areas and do this research? What is that research? And I'm an engineer. I've got I I, I take measurements. I, I I the the field of social psychology is relatively unfamiliar to me. How do how do you as a, a, another Caucasian person? How do you go in and research these things and find out these patterns? Yeah, well, when you go to graduate school for kind of uh, the area I'm in, is like social psychiatry. Um, you do spend <clears throat> about three or four years being trained in how to do these kind of research studies. And there are methods and there are uh, standard procedures and there are kind of formulas that you follow and you use judgment and discretion. Um, I'm currently doing a study of Orthodox Jews here in Montreal. There's a big um, Orthodox Jewish community in Montreal. Um, uh, and very traditional, follow kosher, keep the Sabbath, you know, they, they dress in the traditional garb. Um, and we'll, we've been able to collect data from uh, dozens of uh, Orthodox Jews. We've interviewed them, been to their houses, um, which is a long way of saying that uh, if you follow the kind of standard procedures and the training, it's, it's usually uh, possible to get, get entry and get trusted by these communities. I mean, a couple of the procedures are uh, to take you know, a very step-by-step approach takes time. Uh, another procedure is to get buy-in from kind of community leaders to go and talk to kind of religious ministers, talk to rabbis, uh, make yourself available, answer any questions. Um, another thing we do in these research studies is that you get uh, usually get a grant to fund the study and we use the money to employ research assistants who are members of the community themselves. Mm, cool. okay. So they, they know the community and they often come with me. And I mean, they in, in many of these studies, they do most of the work in the trenches and I'm in the office kind of coordinating. Mm-hmm. Um, um, but also it's also worth saying that it's, it, in a way it shouldn't be surprising, at least if you have a positive view of humanity, because 
um, like, like I said, African Americans, Orthodox Jews, Muslims, uh, the whole gamut. I've done work on Aboriginal people here in Canada. Um, if, if you go in in a uh, an open, transparent, um, hopeful manner and explain to people what you're doing and how this is going to benefit their community, hopefully, and that you're employing people from the community, um, that you're not here to, to lecture them and to tell them how it is, but you're there to, to listen to them and then um, give give them a, help them amplify their voice. That people are typically very receptive. Yeah. Uh, that that makes sense. Yeah. Um, switching gears a little bit, um, I know that you've done work on what we'll, we'll call what you call the the seduction community, um, which I, I had to look up in terms of uh, pickup artists, basically, and and something that we've seen at Visible Man is we'll have somebody come in, and um, there would be um, somebody who wants to improve their quote unquote success with women, or like they have like they've got game and they want to teach people. Um, and that's a whole, uh, not a demographic, but it's a cultural mindset, I suppose, about how, um, men's mental health can be treated. Um, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that and what a unhealthy way to engage in a mental health discussion might be with somebody. Mm. Well, just to give a, a bit of background, it builds nicely on my previous point. I got a grant from the Canadian government to do a study of men who participate in the seduction community. Um, obviously, they're a completely different generation to me and um, different um, uh, philosophy of life, I guess one could say. Um, and when we got the money, we said, great, but how are we going to do this study? How are we going to get access? And who's going to speak to me? And how are we going to listen? But we followed those standard procedures and we, we got entry into the community and uh, we spent like over around a year, myself and my research assistant, um, interviewing men who participate in that community, going to some of their meetups, watching YouTube videos that they suggested that we watch. Um, my research assistant even rented a, with the help of the grant, rented a, a room in one of their houses because they had a spare room for a month <laughs> and with their encouragement actually. Oh my so, gosh. Uh, he embedded himself in the community to, to, for the sake of yeah, learning. That's awesome. Literally. That's great. <laughs> And, and they were the aware that he was doing people. research. <laughs> they, better than that, they invited him. They said, look, Jackie, my, my student, um, my, he said, uh, they said, we have the spare room and we like hanging out with you and we know that you're studying us. So do you want to come and oh. we have someone coming in September, but you can, uh, you can take it for a month. And, and their house was deliberately, um, they deliberately chosen this accommodation in the kind of party street of Montreal. Mm -hmm. So it was right next to the clubs and bars that they like to frequent, and they bring, so we, we were able to Wait, get away. So your research back. assistant got paid to party, it, <laughs> 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 to learn, to learn well, in that environment. Yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's great. That's well, awesome. He wasn't allowed to party, but he was allowed to observe. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. Kind of, kind of tongue in cheek, but it's kind of funny. Yeah, yeah. but he, he certainly got paid to spend time in clubs and, and discos. That's great. And, yeah. And, so and, tell me about what talk to people and listen to them. Um, well, well, um, I think the, it's what we there's what the media says about men in the seduction community, and there's what the reality is, and there's always it's different. Um, so, first of all, fifty percent of men in the, at least in the Montreal seduction community are immigrants, mm. and they're a lot often from North Africa, Middle East, uh, some from Iran, some from like East Asia, and actually, what they told us was that. Uh, when they arrived in, and I, I wrote an academic paper about this study, and the title of the paper is Clueless. And the reason the title of the paper is Clueless is because many of these immigrant men in particular said that when they arrived in Canada as immigrants, in their t a lot of them were in their teenage years, they said they were clueless about social relationships, that in their own country, that there's very prescribed ways of men talking to women and uh, uh, typically the women that you talk to are your cousins or your sisters or your cousins or sisters friends and going to a club and interacting you know that doesn't happen in Tehran or mm. in some of the cities where our, the men in our study were from um, and they said that they felt there was a bit of um, stigma or racism against them because they were kind of Middle Eastern and after 9-11 and stuff mm. and um, so for these men a lot of them said that they joined the community really to try and learn social skills um, and they said that their fathers didn't have these skills because their fathers were not from Canada. They didn't know the Canadian like, norms and uh, ways of acting, social, social interaction. 
Um, so that was for the immigrants. Then for the non-immigrants, uh, we found for a lot of them, uh, similarly, they a lot of them came from broken homes. They've, their parents were divorced. They didn't have a father or an older brother. So there was a kind of void in their life in terms of like male influence. And a lot of them openly said that they joined the community because they didn't really know what it, how to act as a man. Hmm. They needed some guidance. They needed some mentorship. Um, and, and they therefore they were basically seeking help and they joined this community as a way to try and acquire new skills, particularly social and communication skills. Mm. Um, and this goes back to what I said in the beginning about the different rates of mental illness between different ethnic groups in the, in the US, that uh, um, it, it, in my, I'm in my 50s in my generation, um, where did men get their kind of mentorship from? They got it from their father, their grandfather, their uncles, maybe from their priest or their religious minister. Um, maybe uh, I was in like the cadet formation at, um, when I was younger, then I was in the army reserve in my country. Um, so I looked up to my officers and uh, NCOs. <clears throat> um, so I had, a, I'm using myself as a generic example, I had a lot of positive masculine kind of role models when I was younger, growing up in the 80s. Um, but this generation, uh, divorce is much higher, hmm. um, families are, are much uh, more attenuated, so you're less likely to have brothers or cousins. Um, people are less likely to go to church, and, and there's been uh, scandals you know, in Canada, the Catholic Church, and sexual abuse, so there's a lot more suspicion of religious leaders. Um, the, the military has shrunk in size, at least in, in Canada considerably, in the, the military reserve and cadet formations. Um, even things like trade unions where, you know, younger men, when they started a job at like 18 or 19, um, would often join trade unions. There were social clubs associated with the trade union and there was kind of, it was a, an informal mentorship program. Um, I don't know where you work, Jeff, you, you work in kind of manufacturing, mm -hmm. but in, in, in Canada, the unions have gone, you know, kind of evaporated, especially that more pastoral aspect and they're much more focused on kind of negotiating pay rises. and uh, Yeah, yeah. So, so in, in short, I'd like to say kind of nature abhors a vacuum. And we know that many of these men in the seduction community are living in a kind of psychosocial vacuum. They're immigrants, their parents can't really teach them much about the home country or they're, they're Canadian born people who are kind of come from broken families, don't have many friends or family or men in their lives to support them. And they join the community in a search for meaning. Mm. I'm taking all that in because that is uh, that makes a lot of sense what you uh, nature abhors a vacuum um, and what we've seen at least when when somebody comes into the community there's a bit of um, I guess as any when you enter a community you want to kind of find your place and poke around and see how you fit in and there has been there have been men that have come in and kind of tried to puff their chest out and, and assert themselves and they don't always last but there's men that have come in and um, uh, once they realize that we're a gentle place that welcomes them and we can be a supportive environment, it almost sounds like what you're describing is missing in many men's lives um, of uh, w with the dissolution of some of those other organizations and um, support systems that um, really can help guys. So that's really interesting. And that's why when you contacted me, Jeff, I'm, I'm always happy to do these podcasts. I'm doing about one a week, uh, um, some for you know larger organizations, some for smaller, some for mid-size, because organizations like um, Invisible Man, what you're doing here, you're helping fill that vacuum and you're giving men, you know, from what, as far as I can see, a positive uh, influence and a chance to connect with each other and to help and support each other because um, if men do not have these spaces, then they end up in places like the seduction community, which has a dark side and can be kind of unsavory. Um, they could end up in, you know, criminal gangs. They could end up in house angels, or they end, uh, they end up just drinking and taking drugs and, you know, becoming suicidal. So I really do support the kind of small scale. I, I've written papers about this. The kind of small scale grassroots bottom up groups like this you know, is really what is like filling the vacuum. Um, for men. Well, we appreciate you being here. We appreciate yeah. your, your your support. Mm -hmm. um, it, it actually, in one in your most recent blog post on psychology today, you mentioned that trite cliches 
don't help men open up um, and that we should use a multi-pronged approach. Um, and it kind of touches on your previous point about there's not just one solution, there's not just one cause, but I'm wondering what are some of the components of, the, of that approach that you're suggesting? Yeah, so I, I have a um, chapter in my book which is devoted uh, precisely to that topic, the kind of critical ingredients of like men's uh, helpful programs for men. And I think it's important to say that the research shows that there are many different modalities of healing and every individual has a pre may have different preferences. So some people might be happy taking a pill because they're very busy at work and they just want to uh, deal with their mental health that way. Um, others might want to take a more process-based approach where they want to process what their, their life, what's happened, their emotions, and therapy is good for them. Um, but there are many other kind of modalities of healing. And sometimes they're dismissed as kind of escapism mm -hmm. or as, a, um, uh, as, as avoidance. But in fact, the new research shows what we've labeled as escapism is that it can actually sometimes be very helpful. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, exercise interventions um, it's now possible in the UK, at least in some countries, to uh, for the doctor to prescribe you uh, like an exercise intervention for depression. And we do know for men and women, but particularly men, that can be really helpful. Like uh, depending on where you live, like either a gym or an outdoor uh, running group or yoga or this kind of thing. Um, something I alluded to earlier was kind of religious healing. So we do know that for like Aboriginal men, um, other men from uh, maybe other minority cultures, but also all men, um, there are aspects of kind of ritualistic healing, taking part in, in rituals, ceremonies, prayer, uh, meditation, or what's now we now call mindfulness, which to me is basically prayer without a supreme, without supreme being, without directing your mind to a supreme being. Uh, we know that they, that can be helpful. Um, some of the critical ingredients, uh, I talk about shoulder to shoulder healing in my book rather than face to face healing. Um, what shoulder to shoulder, what I mean by that is that we know that men and in particular really value kind of shoulder to shoulder conversation. What does that mean? Uh, if you go for a walk in the woods with somebody and you're walking alongside somebody, that's sometimes, uh, when you have a, a very in-depth, uh, useful conversation. When you're uh, repairing something together, you and your neighbors repairing an old lawnmower, you're chatting about things and you're doing things, that can be very helpful. Uh, those of you who have kind of young uh, adolescent kids, when you're driving um, uh, them to the hockey, you're driving them to, to their sports game in the dark, and they're sitting next to you in the car, that's sometimes when you have the best conversation rather than sitting across the dinner table. So a lot of men, some of the new innovative men's mental health programs are now really trying to take advantage of that shoulder to shoulder activity. Um, but when we chatted last week, Jeff, I told you about kind of bushcraft interventions mm -hmm. um, or wilderness interventions. Uh, these are some of the things which some evidence has shown can be very helpful going out like into the woods for the weekend, um, camping, going fishing, catching your own fish. Uh, some men in that group having more skill than others, so teaching people how to fish, how to gutter fish, maybe hunting, um, teaching people these are the mushrooms you can eat, these are the mushrooms that will kill you, these are the mushrooms that will get you high um, out in the woods, um, and, and learning these kind of skills, um, getting people back to nature. Um, there's an intervention called Men's Sheds in Australia, uh, which is spread all over the world now, which are basically a it's a building, a small building where men go and repair things, do woodwork, do metalwork, uh, do some gardening, do some cooking. And, and, and it's a place, like I said, where more experienced men teach the less experienced men how to do things. And such kind of shoulder to shoulder activity mm -hmm. and evaluation show that this can also be very helpful. Um, so I think these kind of bottom up grassroots programs that emphasize kind of doing, uh, act, uh, they're known as kind of action based modalities of healing where you do something as a common goal, this goal is some exchange of knowledge that people are acquiring, some people are acquiring skills, some people are mentoring others, and everyone can bring something to the table. If you get 10 men, every man will have a skill that maybe the nine other men don't have to the same extent, and the people are, are exchanging this and helping others. And um, uh, in Canada, we have a kind of publicly funded healthcare system, and I've been trying to encourage uh, the government and the powers that be here to uh, invest more money in these uh, 
in these kind of programs and interventions instead of just putting all the money in psychological therapy and medication mm-hmm. management because um, uh, even though they're obviously important components of healing, we do know that men are less likely to use those services than women. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the reasons is there is often, are often preferences for these more kind of action-based, uh, group-based modalities of mm-hmm. healing. Yeah, when we talked last week, that was one of the most... Um, I just had a lot of respect for that observation, which you just said, that I think when people think of healing, they think of... Th- uh, um, talk therapy or uh, cognitive behavioral therapy or medic medication and i can you know i go to the gym regularly i, I do <laughs> anybody who knows me knows that i have a garden an indoor garden that i'll just talk for hours about that is um mm-hmm. somebody told me that the investment that i made in my hydroponic system was about the same cost as one therapy session <laughs> so it, it, there's, there's a lot of different ways that um yeah that, that people can and, and you've got a cat. I, I do. Can you see him? <laughs> uh, uh, yes, having a nice oh, sleep. Yeah, he's, which, yeah um, we're fortunate that normally he, normally when I get nervous for something like this, he'll jump up behind me. So he may actually peek his head up and, and claw his way around. So, <laughs> um. But there is actually an a interesting uh, like animal, it's called animal assisted mm-hmm. therapy, that, uh, which basically some research shows the more that you care for and help animals, uh, the better it can help your mental health. So uh, even those bushcraft interventions, you know, I mentioned kind of fishing and hunting, but you, you don't have to do that. There are, there are other bushcraft where men go out and kind of rescue mm. wounded animals or they go out and camp and put cameras in different places oh, wow. and take, put, film, um, put them in surreptitious places and try and get, you know, bears and uh, coyotes and stuff and then put that on the internet and make videos. I just, and... as you were describing that, I had this feeling of um, pe- like helpfulness or peace or something like that, like petting an animal. It's like, oh, that would that would feel good. I can see how that would be pretty helpful and healing. Mm. And caring for something else, having a, you know, meaning beyond yourself. Yeah, and... yeah for sure. Um, you, you mentioned shoulder to shoulder healing um, and and you also mentioned that men are less likely to seek um, mental health services and they're more likely to talk about their physical health. Can you talk about some of the reasons why men don't open up? Hmm. Well, I just uh, published last week an article on psychology today about that, which uh, I've got some good feedback and some uh, other feedback, which is questioning what I'm saying. but. Um, one of the reasons I say, which is not talked about enough, is that many men, um, we didn't know from research studies that men who kill themselves have actually talked about the, the, the depression that preceded their suicide or their mental health issues. Uh, about 80% of the time they've talked about it with other people, whether it's a general practitioner, a family doctor, a family member, a friend. Um, and, and I always say, well, people, people often say to me, which is one of these myths I said on social media, you know, why, why don't men talk about their feelings or why don't men open up or why, why don't men talk about their problems what's their issue uh, and i always say well who's listening mm. and is the person listening qualified uh, and able and compassionate and competent enough to give useful feedback and direction and help um I, in my psychology today uh, post I, I gave three examples from three of my kind of random uh research studies uh, one gentleman told me that he phoned his sibling uh, during a mental health crisis uh, and the sibling said, oh, I've just started a movie, can you call me back in a couple of hours? Uh, and lo and behold, he did and it went straight to a, a voicemail. Um, another example I give is a, an immigrant man in one of my studies uh, was having mental health difficulties, meaning he couldn't go to work. I think he was a taxi driver or something, or he couldn't do the hours that he used to do. Uh, and he tried to talk about it with his met his wife and his wife would just say to him like what kind of man are you what kind of husband are you you're not providing for your family which um you know that i can understand uh, somewhat you know the responses of these people they um uh people that have to manage their own mental health and maybe they're not in a position to kind of give advice or help but the kind of short answer is that that there isn't really a competent reservoir of competent people in the world willing and able to kind of help men with mental health issues and men often have to seek out kind of groups like yourself or the, the men sheds i talk about or uh, veterans peer support networks i haven't talked about those they're kind of helpful um you know men men want to connect in a place where they 
um, I think a common variable amongst men is they don't want to waste people's time. They don't want to feel their burden mm-hmm. to people. Um, so they want to be in a space where they feel that the people, the, the conversation has a sender and a receiver, mm-hmm. where the receiver is actually listening and open and what wants to help and won't find this that, that they're being a burden and that they're uh, uh, that this is a, a, a annoyance to their average day. So I, I think that's just something that's not talked about enough. And I talk about it in our, in my book that a lot of the blame is put on individual men or a, the finger is pointed at men and saying, well, you're the problem. You're not talking about your mental health. You're not opening up. You're keeping it all in. You're, you're stubborn. You're intransigent. Um, and uh, the research, in my, my own research and the wider research which shows that's not really the case. A lot of men, most men have opened up uh, they just feel they've been shut down or haven't received the, the listening mm-hmm. ear. Um, and, and people have talked about this, which uh, um, that for women, um, there are research studies which shows for women it's a bit of a different experience because women are often put in the category of like women and children, that they're kind of vulnerable beings, kind of benevolent sexism, one could say, that people are more willing to kind of listen to their problems and to uh, try and point them in the right direction uh, because they... Uh, through benevolent sexism, a lot of people see women as a kind of vulnerable, childlike creature who needs kind of help and direction. Whereas, in contrast, men are seen as this, uh, uh, this uh, a sex that doesn't need that kind mm-hmm. of assistance. The um, yeah, at least I was kind of internally nodding my head as you were saying all those things because I, I know that I've experienced that, and probably all of us have to some degree. But when you try to share something, it, it there's a there's a vulnerability that can be easily um, bruised when you open up. So yeah, I, um, oh, and by the way, for the listeners, we'll have all the links to Rob Doctor Doctor Whitley's um, uh, articles uh, in uh, Psychology Today and his book in the in the show notes. Um, I want to transition over to questions um, that the audience has been asking as mm-hmm. we've been going along. Um, so sure. can we ask, is there something that can be done to encourage men to reach out for therapy? Mm. Um, I mean, in the US, my understanding is that uh, therapy is not um, often reimbursed by uh, health insurance plans to start with. Um, so, I mean, there's one, there's a, I mean, I'll start with the first principle. The wider point is that I think we need to ensure that the clinical services and society and men and women individu- as individuals are uh, see mental health and physical health uh, equally and that they're treated equally by healthcare providers, by insurance systems, um, by employees, by bosses. Because um, I said in my last article that a lot of men, um, especially in the US where it's, it's a bit different system compared to European and countries in Canada and Australia. Um, a lot of people are fearful of losing their job if they tell their boss or their employee that they have mental health issues, that they need time off to see a mental health therapist, that uh, uh, they, 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 they need uh, some accommodation in the workplace, etc. Whereas if you told your boss that you had diabetes or asthma mm. and you need time to, if you had uh, diabetes and you need to take, go inject yourself with insulin a few times a day and maybe if you eat the wrong food or don't eat the right food, you need a 10 minute break just to get your blood back. Your boss would be overwhelming in compassion or if you broke your leg in a you know, motorcycle accident mm-hmm. or something. Um, so, so I think we like, it's the multi-pronged approach I talked about that Jeff mentioned earlier. Uh, we can focus on men and, and getting them to open up more, but we need to focus on the system, uh, health insurance, therapy, employees, their attitude, education, institutions, their attitude, uh, the military, you know, a lot of men I work with are in the military or in the police or being in the police, that they often have very Byzantine attitudes to kind of mental health. And um, so I, I think we do need that kind of multi-pronged mm-hmm. approach. I mean, I know Jeff. I mean, in America, how much you know? What 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 is the hourly rate for a? Because I'm I, as you said to the, the guys, I live in Canada, so it's mm-hmm. it's kind of reimbursed here. What what's the kind of hourly rate to see like a good therapist? My therapist, who I've been with um, for five six years, and she's wonderful, is about one hundred and ten dollars. Yeah, and I have a, a personally, yeah. I have a high deductible plan. So, as a single person, my deductible is about five thousand dollars a year. So I pay out of pocket up to 
that amount. So I pay full price up until um, up until that dollar amount is reached. Yeah, yeah. So it it is a um, for I'm divorced. You know, I've got expenses like anybody. Um, but it, it it's a it's something yeah. I have to budget for. It's not something I can just do. So um, there's like you said, there's a there's a, a vacuum <laughs> that um, mm -hmm. you know, we're hoping that men can find support if they can't afford therapy. Um, but uh, there's other ways, like you like you've mentioned. Um, and actually, that, that leads to our next question, which I think you've sort of addressed, but maybe you can comment more on it. Um, somebody asks, can religion act as therapy for men? I mean, I wouldn't use the word therapy, but there are aspects from the research studies that I and many other people have done, there are aspects of religion which can be very helpful for men. Um, so in some of the studies I do, I've done, uh, men tell me that, you know, just praying like once or twice a day, whatever their religion is, Jewish, Muslim, Christian, uh, having that space to kind of get in touch with the divine and to, to, to be quiet has been helpful. Um, I, I know people who read scripture, whatever their scriptures shall be, uh, Christians who are reading like the Psalms or reading the Bible um, and thinking about the stories, uh, like the story of Job or the story of the uh, the Exodus, the parting of the Red Sea, and it's um, uh, today it's Ash Wednesday. Many of the listeners might be aware it's the start of the Christian season of Lent. So I have heard people say, you know, during Lent they, they think about their lives as a time of kind of self denial yeah. and thoughtfulness. Um, uh, I know people here in Canada who go to kind of churches, people with more severe mental illnesses, who are kind of maybe work part time or unemployed and as part of their like daily routines, they'll go to a church, they'll sit in the pew, they'll just sit quietly, they might have a conversation with the priest and it, often it's the only conversation they have in the course mm -hmm. of the day. Um, I work at a hospital, we have chaplains, Jewish, Jewish, Christian, Muslim, who visit patients. So uh, that those religious, we do know that those religious activities do help people's mental health. Like there's been huge surveys of thousands of people and people who are more regularly engaging in prayer, going to a place of worship, reading scripture, um, have tend to have better mental health, lower suicide, lower substance abuse, people who are members of a religious community. Um, so, you know, for many men, they're kind of isolated, lonely if they get involved in a, a church or synagogue or something. They, they have a ready-made community who, who, who usually are typically kind of yeah. welcoming. So, uh, I mean, I sounds like I'm preaching for here, but I'm just kind of repeating what the research literature says. It, it's pretty um, informative. It's pretty fascinating. It, it's uh, just to have that scope that how helpful it can be. So, yeah, I appreciate that. I mean, if someone's like really lonely, if somebody's very lonely and isolated, I, I would, and I've done it in my own personal life, tell them like just, you know, whatever your religion, go to your local church mm -hmm. or synagogue and phone up the priest there and say, look, I've, I've just moved into the neighborhood or I'm new, uh, I'm my faith, I'm a lapsed Catholic or lapsed Protestant mm -hmm. or whatever, and I'm, I want to get more involved. And these churches are mm -hmm. desperate for people, um, at least up here in Canada, to like, help out with the, the youth club or help out with the old, old help giving tea to the old people or visiting the, the widows. And mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah, I would certainly recommend it to anyone who's like, you know, struggling in these yeah. community. Yeah. Um, the next question is, when we discuss men's issues, we tend to get grouped in with misogynistic groups or catch flack because, quote, women have it worse. How do we encourage open and honest discussions while navigating that? I feel that's become less of a, 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 of a potential challenge over the last few years. So in, in like 2015, 16, uh, I do remember hearing more from pe people telling me like, oh, you should be careful, like writing about this or researching this or because, pe you know, some people will find it misogynistic or, uh, and I have heard from a few, like very few people that, you know, some disgruntled students, like you shouldn't talk about this in class and men and women, this kind of gender war. Uh, I feel it's got a lot better in recent years and uh, I feel uh, one thing I always say is that if you don't have healthy men, you don't have a healthy society and you don't have a healthy family. 
Um, and I know you've said, Jeff, you're divorced, and probably a lot of men on the call it call are. But you know, even if you're divorced, you have sons, daughters, you have sisters, you have mothers, fathers. You're often caring for you know your elderly parents, and you're, you've got colleagues. You're part of society. Um, and if you don't have healthy men, then you, you do end up with uh, you know men joining groups like the seduction community or um, neo-Nazi groups or extreme religious groups um, unless there's some way to allow men to be healthy forms of themselves and support them when they're in those kind of isolated, lonely, mm-hmm. vulnerable periods. Um, and uh, Like I said, that benefits the men themselves, but it also benefits their wives, their, their daughters, their, their sons, their mothers, their fathers, and society as a whole. So um, that's my typical kind of response to that question. And, and obviously it's not a zero sum game mm. no, one, no one is <laughs> saying or implying that money should be uh, diverted to men's mental health and not to mm. women's mental health actually quite the contrary there are many um, uh, women's services that obviously we all support uh, women's refuges and homeless shelters and, uh, and people are just saying we also need to have some things for men and like, tailor it to the male pre- to the preferences mm. of men um, and then just one final question um, where do you see the most untapped areas for men's mental health, or where do you, what where do you see the most opportunity going forward for this? Um, so when we talk about kind of health programs or health interventions, uh, we can split it into kind of uh, two different types. One of the kind of health services and health interventions, which are delivered by hospitals, by health clinics, by primary health care providers, by family doctors, by social workers and by uh, psychologists, and et cetera. And then there are kind of health, there are health interventions and health programs delivered more by grassroots organizations. So I've mentioned some of them, men's sheds, um, veterans peer support groups, uh, the group you've got here, Jeff, like, you know, online support groups, the Invisible Man, uh, once a week, I'm doing podcasts for like groups like this or webinars. Um, these kind of wilderness bushcraft uh, interventions, which are often deliver- delivered by just a group of guys in a you know, in rural areas in different in Australia and Canada and the US, who kind of get together. And one of them is often maybe has a bit of training, but has um, in psychology, but it's it's really out there to help other men. Um, I think this is the future of men's mental health. I think these, these grassroots groups, uh, these, uh, like I said, bushcraft interventions, men's sheds, bottom up, locally grounded, run by like real men, for men. When I say real men, what I mean by that is not not just men with PhDs and with MDs who are, who are really, even though I mean, I have a PhD, many of us are kind of compassionate and want, want to help men. It's our job, we're being paid to like do this. Whereas for these grassroots groups, it's, it's, a, it's a passion many uh and some of them are raising money to help out with the expenses but but it, it's not a um uh it, it, it's not coming from a point of financial gain or, or employment uh, and i really think these kind of grassroots groups are, uh, are where the future is and in canada what i i um uh, i've been working with a member of part the canadian parliament who is uh, the equivalent of a, i guess a congressman in the u.s a representative um, trying to get the government to kind of give five-year block funding to these kind of grassroots group um, and to take maybe some of the money out of the health budget. 50% of mental health care in Canada goes to mm. mental hospitals. Um, often that's in like, you know, the cost of building maintenance and planting trees in the gardens and uh, uh, having like 20 secretaries dealing with the, the medical records. And we've been, we've been saying, let's take some of that money and give it these grassroots groups are of, often um, existing on a shoestring budget, um, but they're doing a lot of great work locally grounded, local men knowing the context of other local men. Um, it's, they're not one size fits all solutions. So some of these groups are like Aboriginal men for Aboriginal men, they're black men for black men, they're veterans for other veterans. Um, so that they kind of know the community, but give them some kind of block grants, five year block grants, so that they can maybe hire a full time secretary, pay rent for a uh, a small room or small office, or, you know, the, this thing you're doing here obviously has requires a lot of technical equipment. You've got to produce it as yourself, Jeff. There's, uh, you're going to have to do some editing afterwards, marketing. Give some kind of money to this, 
uh, with the aim of helping men get on back their, back on their feet so they can many people with mental health issues many men are kind of unemployed or underemployed or you know it's an investment because if we can fund these groups and mm. get men back on their feet and they go from people who are really maybe not contributing as much as they could in society to being contributors to society yeah. so that's the kind of argument that i'm kind of making currently. that's um that gives me a lot of hope um because i have a lot of respect for the work that you've done um and your com your compassion and your your care for helping really comes across and so to have you recognize that um even a small organization that can make a make a difference in one person's life. I mean, when when I started this, my, my goal was to to help one person, um, and and I've had many conversations where um, I feel like I'm making a difference. And you're right, I'm not paid for this. <laughs> my shoestring budget is a good way to describe it. And so to <laughs> to see that um, to to see that you that it's recognized as something that is a that gives you hope that, that that can make a difference is really um, encouraging. So um, I appreciate hearing that. Um, so, I, I mean, I told you, Jeff, last yeah. week, just one final thing. You know, I'm doing these podcasts regularly, and uh, there's groups like yours up and down Canada, and the U.S., and the U.K. And it, they're often one man invited me to a podcast, and it was very professional. I said, "This must cost you a bit of money." And the group you organize, they have like online profiles. And he said, yeah, I had to remortgage my house to, mm -hmm. to fund this, but he believes in it so deeply that he felt it was worth it. And I um, hope he feels somehow he'll recoup some money somewhere down the line. Yeah. But, uh, and that's the kind of devotion we're seeing. That's, that's why I said, like, you know, maybe in the US, they have state governments or municipal governments or someone somewhere who has some money that they can, you know, devote to help these organizations yeah. flourish in yeah. life. Yeah, it's... Um... I think we have the same philosophy of helping, um, and uh, it's, it's, you know, yeah, I, I, I do it to help, and I, I know that you do too. So I'm sure that we'll, we're, we're pushing in the same direction. So I appreciate that you're here with us, um, Dr. Whitley, and mm -hmm. um, uh, for mm -hmm. for all the all the references that you've made during our discussion um, when we publish this, we'll have the links in the in the show notes. Um, and for anybody who's listening, um, we have a Discord server where we have daily discussions, moderated discussions with men and women um, that uh, encourage men to open up and connect um, so that we can make a difference. So I really appreciate you being here with us tonight, Dr. Whitley, and uh, we'll talk soon. Yeah, and if anyone is ever in the uh, Montreal region, feel free to drop me an email and I'd, I'd be happy to uh, meet you for a beer or something else or walk around the city and Wonderful. show you some of the sites. Great. Thanks very much.